Okay, uh, good evening everybody and welcome to the latest in our series of talks um, on and related to Roman roads. This is one I know a lot of people have been waiting for, um, delivered by John Poulter, who I'm sure most of you know um, is best known in our field for his work on surveying and Roman road planning. In fact, I think I can probably say there's not really anybody who knows as much about it as John does. Um, but today he's not talking so much about that. He's oh, a little bit, I imagine. Um, but he's specifically talking about the road over High Street, which has been uh, claimed as a Roman road for a very long time indeed. Um, but several of us are, how should we say, less convinced. Um, so after John's presented all the evidence, we will let you make your own minds up as to whether it is or is not actually a Roman road. As you know, this talk is actually being recorded. So if I can ask everybody to make sure that they are muted and their videos are turned off. Um, I and if you can do so during the, the, keep so during the course of the talk, please. Um, we will be using the chat function for people to put questions. Those will be relayed to me at the end, and then I'll put them to John on your behalf. If there is anybody who has difficulty typing in the chat, and I know one or two of our regulars do, um, then if you can possibly send uh, a brief, brief note to the, to the chat to say you want to ask a, a question later, uh, then please do. And, I will ask you to do it right at the very end. Um, alternatively, if you just wait to the end when everybody is finished and all the other questions are done, then we may still have time to let you ask your own question, but um, we don't want a free for all. So we can we avoid that if we possibly can. Okay, and with no further ado, um, I'm gonna hand over to John Poulter. Um, over to you, John. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for watching there. Um, this talk's an expanded version of the presentation which I'd prepared originally for the 2016 uh, Roman Roads Research Association Conference in York, but it was delivered uh, very kindly for me by Rob Entwistle because I was indisposed at the time. So it's, it's nice to be just perhaps a, a little bit closer to yourselves, if not actually right beside you, um, uh, this evening there. Um, this, oops. Sorry, this should be going on to the next screen, it's not. Right, sorry, sorry there, let me just try and get that started again. No, sorry, no, uh, no idea what's happening there. It's worked in the past, uh, right? Okay, John, can can you just check um, that you haven't got two versions of PowerPoint running? Do you oh. know how to do that? Right, hang on, let's just uh, go back to uh, that point. Yes, I've got both. Do you want one of them removing? Sorry, wait, you've got both. Uh, I've got the original, this one. Yeah, so so clo close both of the PowerPoints and then just open the one that you want. Right, okay. Let's... Right, let's see if that's working. Well, it's working at this end. Can you see me? Have you have you shared? Uh, no. It's, uh... no. Unfortunately, I need to be off the screen. Let me just uh, get back to the... Uh... Uh... The zoom. Right, let's try sharing screen again. Uh, I'll go on to this one and then open it up and let's see if that works. Uh, I'll get onto slideshow. Over on the left from beginning. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, All right, let's see if that goes now. Yes, we're off. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. I no idea what happened there. Right. Okay. Shall I continue? 
Yes, John, please do. Okay, right. Okay. Sorry about that then. Right, let's start again. So this is a sketch map of the main Roman roads in the north of England and uh, Scotland. And I'll be returning to it uh, several times, I think. Um, for those watching from abroad who may not be familiar with the English uh, uh, geography, the Lake District is here, uh, in this area here, in northwest England. Let me just change the pointer, by the way. That's right. So in this area here. Okay. Uh, well, this is a terrain model of the Lake District, and um, you can see it's a mixture of hills, valleys, and lakes. It's very pretty. And uh, you might be able to notice along here, this ridge along here, it's prominent one which runs from Penrith up, uh, at the top here down towards Lake Windermere here at the bottom. Uh, and that's the ridge on which our so-called Roman road runs. So let's have a closer look at it there. Uh, by the way, I've created this model. You can create them from various um, directions, but I've created with the sunlight in the low southeast. And this means that the dark areas here are the valleys. Okay, uh, and the bright areas here are the high areas. It's, it's perhaps the reverse of what you're perhaps normally used to with maps, but uh, it brought things out more clearly from, uh, from my point of view there. Well, this is the route of the road, um, which the road takes across that ridge, shown in red there. The highest point of the ridge uh, stands at a height of uh, 2,719 feet, which in metric is 828 meters above sea level. And it has the name High Street. It overlooks a little blue tarn here called Blee Tarn, um, or Blee Water, sorry. Uh, now High Street itself is a most unusual name for a hill in, uh, in Britain. But elsewhere in the country, something called High Street or Street Farm or Street Side uh, is often a sign that it was uh, a Roman road or there was a Roman road nearby. And I think this is one of the reasons which has led people to think that the road over High Street uh, was Roman uh, as well there. So this raises the question really of what is a Roman road? Well, we shouldn't forget that the Romans occupied this area of Britain for more than 300 years. Working backwards from today, that would take us back to before the time of Queen Anne. So undoubtedly, hundreds of Roman feet will have trodden this way in Roman times. It's a natural route from the north to the south of the lakes, albeit it's a very exposed one, as you'll see. Um, hence, it's likely that thousands of feet will have trodden it before the Romans arrived, and thousands more will have done so after the Romans left. Indeed, there are reports that the route was routinely used for carrying peat down to Windermere, that's the south side down here, um, in the eight, uh, uh, before the railways made uh, coal widely available, the railway reached Windermere in 1847. And that in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, fairs were held up here, on top of High Street, um, each year, with games, wrestling and horse racing taking place up there. It was an unlikely spot, but they did apparently, it went on for several uh, years. However, just because the Romans would have made use of this route, doesn't mean they actually built a road there. So before examining the road of a high street, let me show you some examples of uh, definite Roman roads crossing high ground. I began following Roman roads in the 1950s, uh, then, but these were often roads which had modern surfaces on top, so you could see the alignment, but you couldn't see anything particularly Roman about them. But in the 1960s, I began to follow Roman roads over the moors and high ground, where they're more likely to be in original condition. But let's begin with the western main road. That's this one running from Manchester here up to uh, what is now Kirby Thaw. Uh, there. Uh, and we'll look at it where it crosses the Boland Fells. This is just about here. Uh, there. The fells are just north of Ribchester. Um, well, this was one of two uh, trunk Roman roads to the north on either side of the Pennines. And like the eastern main road, which is Eaton Trunk Road, which is this one here, Deer Street, running here up through Newstead and on towards uh, Edinburgh, um, the western main road hasn't attracted a, a modern name uh, since Roman times. Uh, well, after crossing the forest of Boland uh, at a height of from more than 1,400 feet, which is 430 metres, uh, here it is, descending uh, Bottom Head Fell, 
and heading northwards uh, towards the uh, valley of the River Loon, which is uh, over yonder. Here's a road here, from stretching from here to here. Uh, there, quite a width. It runs down the hillside here, crosses over the by this gulch, uh, and then runs along over here uh, at this point. Uh, it's another, another shot of it. Yes, because. Uh, and uh, you oh, can see right. the Roman road there with uh, slightly cambered uh, ditches on either side here. Um, sorry about the red stick, it won't, won't go beyond the end of the screen, but anyway, uh, that's <laughs> discovery of a few days ago. Um, the course chosen for this road, though, is a daft one. Um, it's highly exposed to inclement weather. Uh, I don't think there have been any trees in Roman times, uh, for instance. And this, combined with its lack of a post-Roman name, suggests that the road would probably have been abandoned uh, very soon after the Romans left. Um, and it, the important thing, from our point of view, is it's likely that the remains, therefore, are the Roman originals. Uh, incidentally, I must apologise for the quality of some of the photographs which I'll be showing. Um, most of them were taken in my early days with photography. Uh, these two shots haven't been too bad, but you'll see some worse in a bit. Uh, I was using my brother's Zeiss Vera camera, which had a superb lens, but was otherwise pretty basic. And in particular, it had no built-in light meter. So I had to carry a separate light meter and then transfer the settings to the camera physically. And this, not surprisingly, perhaps gave rise to several over or underexposed shots. And of course, in the old days, you didn't get the, you didn't realize you'd done that until you got the film back from the developer. Well, I've tried to correct some of these using modern technology, but this is only possible so far as it goes before things start to get lurid colors or old clouds start to appear in the sky that weren't there before. So my photographs won't be entirely professional quality throughout, I'm afraid, but I hope they'll serve. Now, the other thing is the 1960s were early days for me in the identification of Roman roads, and I made many mistakes. And I'll show you some of these mistakes along the way since it's instructive. Well, let's look at this again, this map of the Roman roads. Up till about uh, eight years ago, it was thought that the Western Main Road would run up here, uh, run through the Loon Gorge, cross onto Crobs Crosby Ravensworth Fell just there, and then turn and branch off and run to the Roman Fort of Broome near Penrith. But thanks to LIDAR in 2013, the late uh, Hugh Toller showed that the Western Main Road had run to the fort at Kirby Thor instead. In other words, he showed thanks to LIDAR that it ran here. To the fort at Kirby Thor, just there. I've left the film uh, course in dot with dotted lines just in case there might have been a branch to it. It wouldn't, wouldn't seem un, uh, unreasonable, although I believe there's no firm evidence for, for it at all there. What's interesting though is since Kirby Thor is the start of this road here, so called the Maiden Way, which runs up to the fort of Carvoran, right beside the uh, Hadrian's Wall uh, here, uh, this means that the Maiden Way can now possibly be seen as a continuation of the Western Main Road, which wasn't, it wasn't thought about that beforehand. Although it was built to a lesser standard uh, there. I'll, well, let's have a look. Uh, here's um, uh, a maiden way. Uh, it's crossing below Melbourne Fell at a height of 2,200 feet. So it's had quite some climbing to do there. That's 670 meters above sea level. And you'll notice that it's got a, 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 a much clearance of boulders on the side here, uh, on here. And these boulders occur naturally. You can see in this uh, peat hag uh, here, all these are here, and they're also over here as well. Uh, there. Apparently, there can be a sliding action which occurs when thawing takes place over frozen ground. Um, and this can cause minor landslips and boulders to be moved uh, there. So sometimes, of course, onto the road, like some of these here, for instance. Uh, there. And uh, clearly, the, these have been cleared after the road was built, uh, and it's very likely that clearance was done after the Roman period as well as during it uh, there. So we've probably got some post-Roman usage of this road uh, there. Nevertheless, it, uh, it looks to be original to me, and this view was uh, shared by Dave Went of English Heritage, which is now Historic England, uh, who'd recently carried out a detailed examination of the Maiden Way at this point. So there we are, cambered, uh, rough stuff on top there. Uh, no, no sign of ditches here, particularly. In fact, well, perhaps one there on that side. Now the next shot is taken just over the hill here, uh, looking back up uh, there. So that's here we are. That was the top of the hill before, and here's the Roman road coming down towards us. You can see it's not quite as clear as it was on top, but still 
uh, pretty clear, I think, here on the ground, uh, quite different from the surface this side and this side. Uh, again, cambered, uh, tufted grass uh, there, um, and um, hummocky, yes, hummocky on top there, and very solidly built still. Now, this is where one of the, uh, my earliest mistakes occurred as well because after descending for behind me uh, from Melbourne Fell, the maiden way crosses the Rowgill Burn, it descends quite a bit, and then climbs quite steeply up into the Gilderdale Forest. And just before it does that, it's crossed by the A686 road from Alston to Penrith. It has to transfer, trans traverse a small ravine just near there. And so I was looking around for any signs of Roman bridge abutments across the ravine, and I came across this culvert in what appeared to be an extraordinary state of preservation. I mean, it's still running with water here, you've got stones on top. And I thought, good heavens, can this be, can this be real? Um, it wasn't mentioned in any books I read at all. But then um, even more so, I turned to my right and there was this, a road coming, clear road coming down towards me, very clearly made as well there. Well, I got very excited at the time, as you might imagine. But unfortunately, it was all too good to be true. When I looked into, into it, I found that the number of roads had been built in this area between Alston and Penrith in the Turnpike era, and one of them by uh, John Loudon McAdam, no less, the famous road engineer. Indeed, it's possible if this, this road um, was, was uh, built by McAdam himself, then it would date from 1823. If not, and it's probably been uh, previously constructed in the 18th uh, century. Either way, these clearly weren't the remains of a 2000 year old Roman road. So what are the giveaways? Well, here we are, the flat surface for a start across here. Okay. Uh, the tufted rather than uh, uh, hummocky grass and above all the sharp edges of the road here, sharp edge here, less so here, but still fairly sharp as well. Those are all giveaways for a more modern road. So let's have a look at another example of a Roman road. This one is the Stain Gate. It runs between Carlisle and uh, Corbridge, just behind Hadrian's Wall uh, there. Um, it's, the following photograph was taken when it was crossing high ground between the well-known fort of Vindolanda, which is just about here, and the forklet of Holt Whistle Burn, which is just about uh, here there. So here it is, uh, coming towards us. Here's the road, fairly clearly showing uh, there, with the camber again. Long grass, well, it's not tufted, but sort of long grass itself. But look at this embankment at this side here. It's like a railway embankment. Uh, there. Incredible. It really is extraordinarily well built up. Um, there is, I have to admit, a bit of a sharp edge just here, but I think that's to do with a more recent modification or alteration to the road, because the same gate has stayed in uh, use uh, for quite a long time, for quite recent times. And in fact, some parts of it still are in use. I think the original Roman ditch was probably a bit here, nearer this side here. Um, well, for a more direct comparison between a modern and a Roman road, uh, we need to look at uh, Deer Street uh, up here um, at the north uh, in Scotland, just to the south of uh, Newstead, just about here, where it's starting to climb into cover across the Cheviot Hills, just about here. Um, this is the shot itself. Here you can see very clear road uh, there, but, but equally very clearly modern. Um, it's got uh, bracing here, which is timber bracing. In fact, this is probably late 20th century, uh, this road here. The English border, by the way, is just up here, so we're only just in Scotland at this point. Uh, there. But the Roman road is this humpy thing here on the right. It carries on a, a beside the track, this new modern track, all the way to the top. Uh, there. Um, I think there's been a recent attempt to make this part of Deer Street into a, a long distance pathway, in which case I think this is one of the reasons for making this uh, there. It also would have kept the walkers uh, feet off the Roman road and stopped them wearing it uh, away, which can be a problem uh, there. And also <laughs> it's a lot easier to walk on, I can tell you. Mind that this uh, hummocky service here might not be part of the Roman original. There's another risk here. Um, Deer Street remained uh, an important part of a through route between England and Scotland until quite recent times. 
And so repairs to the surface could have been made in several places and at several times since the Roman era. Uh, some eight or nine miles south of this point, that's on the English side of the border, uh, Duncan Hale and colleagues excavated down to the Roman level, which was quite deep under the surface, in 2002. However, what they found separated from it by a considerable thickness of silt were two more stone road surfaces. And they were judged in the end to be post medieval in date. Now, the fact that you know, such repairs had been undertaken in such a remote spot, or it's right in the middle of nowhere, is a reminder of what may appear to be convincing in Roman, might not always be so. And so you do need to bear that in mind when looking for Roman roads. Well, the complexity of um, such questions is well illustrated by this uh, penultimate example I'll show you. It's called the Cam Fell Road. And it runs from a place called Ingleton, about here. Uh, and it runs up to about here, which is under Deer Street, the Roman fort of Bainbridge in the middle of Wednesday. Uh, there. Um, well, firstly, I need to apologize for the quality of this slide. Um, but go back to photography again. It's one of my first attempts to photograph a Roman road. And I'd yet to learn that trying to use a shutter speed of one eighth of a second with slow speed film on a handheld camera on a windy day is not a good idea. So it's blurred, I'm sorry. I've tried to sharpen up the image as much as I can, so I hope you can see what looks to be like the remains of Roman Aga with a ditch alongside here, despite the modern tractor traps damaging it. Uh, um, so I was actually very pleased. Ooh, you know, great stuff. Found another Roman road here. I hope it was well marked on the Ordnance Survey map. But not long afterwards, I visited the fort at Bainbridge itself, which is where the road's heading, and spoke to Brian Hartley, who was excavating there at the time. And Brian asked me uh, if I'd realised that the Camfell Road, which is this one, um, had been um, uh, turnpiked in the 18th century, which I hadn't. So uh, it seemed that I'd been looking at a turnpike road after all. Uh, however, in his description of the Camfell Road in the Roman Roads Research Association's Gazetteer, Mike Hacken uh, reports that the turnpiking of this stretch of the road was undertaken very quickly, suggesting that little needed to be done to bring it up to the required standards. And so the implication is that maybe I have been looking at a Roman road after all. Uh, really don't, don't know for certain there. The final mistake, uh, or at least uncertainty, which I'll show you, concerns a possible uh, Roman road running uh, down the River Rothy between Kirby Stephen and Sedba. Now, Kirby Stephen is just about here, just south of the St. Moore Pass Road, and Sedba is just down here, on the, uh, just beside the Roman Road over the, near the Loon Gorge. So the road runs just across there. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, the modern road which follows that uh, course is the, known as the A683, and as whilst looking at a map of the area, I noticed it had been what appeared to be an earlier road, which took off from the 683 to follow a much more direct line to cross the River Rothy upstream. And moreover, in doing so, it passed three places called, respectively, the Street, Street Farm and Street Side. And what's more, after crossing the River Rothy, it then ran, ran along the shoulder of a hill called Bluecaster. Well, this is a picture of the road running along the shoulder of Bluecaster. This is Bluecaster up here. This is the hill over there. And the road actually shows very clever planning because it's running just above the spring line, uh, just about along here where springs start to break out and then run down the hillside here towards where the Rothy runs in this valley. And of course, those uh, little springs start to form little ravines which get quite deep and uh, steep sided as you get further down the hillside. Well, this road very cleverly avoids all that. It runs just above the start of the spring line uh, there. Um, in addition to this, um, uh, there, there was a Roman fort called Bruff, only about four miles north of Kirby Stephen, which was on the uh, Stainmore Pass Road. So there are to be good grounds for feeling that uh, I discovered a new Roman road here. Again, it's quite chuffed. However, it appears that I'd spotted the same features at about the same time, which was in the 1960s, uh, uh, as some other people. And a description of the road duly appeared in the 1973 edition of Ivan Margery's Roman Roads in Britain, with a number um, 731 allocated to it. 
Well, if I'm looking at this long enough now to realise there's nothing Roman at all about this view of the road beside um, uh, Blue Caster. Flat, smooth surface, uh, sharp edges there, and no tufted, no, no, no deep grass at all there. It is possible, of course, that there could be a Roman road underneath it, but it doesn't look like it to me, and I understand that no trace of Roman construction has been found under any other part of that, uh, this road, or shown up anywhere else on LIDAR investigation. And here I'm very grateful for a correspondence with David Ratcliffe about uh, Ratledge uh, about two or three um, weeks ago, when he'd been looking at it again and again came up with nothing showing on the LIDAR. So I feel my earlier enthusiasm was mistaken, despite the encouraging place names, and it's unlikely the Romans had actually built a road between Kirby Stephen and Sedba. I did go, go to discuss this possibility, though, with Tom Clare, when he was a um, county archaeologist for Westmoreland. And during our discussion, I mentioned that I'd recently walked the road over High Street in the Lake District and photographed it from end to end. Oh, said Tom, and do you think it is Roman? It was a question put openly without emphasis, but it had been staggered. Up to that moment, I'd never doubted that the road over High Street had been Roman. All the books said so, the Ordnance Survey mapped it as such, and Ivan Margaret had given a road a number, 74. But from that moment, I'd started to think. So now, let's start to look at the road itself over High Street. I'll, uh, I'll show you the slide first and then discuss the arguments for and against its Romanness afterwards. At present, though, do appreciate that when I took these photographs, I fully believe that the road was Roman, and my aim was simply to record all of the Roman remains which I could see along the way. Uh, nearly all the slides that you'll be seeing were taken on the same day, 1968, when I walked over High Street from, uh, from the north, about up here, all the way over to here, and over to here, and then back again. Uh, there. It's about 20 miles as the uh, crow flies, and there's a lot more than that on the ground, I think. I only left out the steep descent. There's a very steep descent here down at, uh, of course, Scotch Rake. And I left that out and returned a couple few days later just to take that in from the bottom of this valley up to here. That sounds like it's chiming at eight o'clock, folks. Yeah. It's true that I made a couple of trips uh, some two years beforehand. I'd walked up from here, from Horswater, up to here, onto High Street, to have a look at the road on the top uh, uh, there. And at least one of these trips was made in winter, and so there are a couple of slides which I'll be showing you of the road in snow. However, I didn't, and uh, I still have, don't uh, live in the area, and so I've had no opportunity to carry out reconnaissances, say over a number of weekends, just to find out where the road might be if it wasn't where it wasn't clear. Go there. Instead, uh, on the, in the time available within a single day, I just had to rely entirely on the line of the road as shown on the Ordnance Survey maps of the day. Unfortunately, this line proved to be very accurate. I took the photographs both going and returning, but as it happens, most of the pictures were taken facing north, looking back this way. It wasn't any policy decision here, it was just that the remains of the road seemed to show up more clearly, or perhaps the light was better, when facing north. But I'll be showing the sequence of pictures working from north to south. So we'll work down this way, all the way down to the end here. Um, and it, so it might appear that I'm often uh, looking backwards. But at any rate, I'll always show you the, um, the direction, I'll tell you the direction which the camera was facing. Right, well, the first shot was taken here on Brown Rig, which is about here where the arrow's pointing. Uh, there at a height of about 1300 feet, which is 400 meters. Uh, there, uh, the view is looking uh, to the north towards this hill here. Whew, I don't, it's, it's spelled H E H E U G H S C A R. I pronounce it Huscar, but that could be wrong. So, my apologies if it is there. So, at first sight, this here looked uh, possibly encouraging. Uh, there. But unfortunately, what the picture doesn't show is that there are several of these mounds, either this side or this side of the camera. Uh, and I had the job really of trying to pick out the one that looked likeliest to be a, a Roman agar. And stepping back a little, so looking in the same direction, this is Hughes Car Hill here, uh, there, you can see that the roads, this uh, mound is tapering towards us, which if it's Roman, it shouldn't do. And in addition, there's no sign of a road in the distance. There's nothing uh, there indicating uh, Roman remains uh, there. Um, 
So the advantage of hindsight, uh, hindsight, I now suspect this is just a natural feature which happened to be approximately in the right place. And hence, what, what at first looked to be promising turns out to have been probably misleading, which is a not uncommon experience, I'm afraid. This is a view looking south in the same direction. This might look more promising here. You can see there's a, a bankment here, uh, or rather a camber at least, and, and it might possibly be one of these two things continuing here offline. But there's nothing further up here at all showing any continuation. So again, although it perhaps look a little more promising, I still think there's no sign really. This is uh, convincingly a Roman road uh, there. This is a bit further up the hill, a badly exposed picture. My apology for that, I'll do my best to correct it. Again, a mound here in front, which I thought might have been part of the Roman road. Uh, I don't think so. There's, there's nothing much showing. That's Huskar Hill in the distance again there. Well, this far, I'd walked four and a half miles uh, and climbed several hundred feet and been rewarded really by not very convincing indications of a Roman road, but worse was to follow. The next viewpoint, oops, the next viewpoint is, is on the uh, slopes leading up to Lode Pot Hill. This is Lode Pot Hill here, and here we are climbing up to it. And this next view is here, looking backwards, looking north again uh, there. So here we are, and here you can see now a, a path has uh, uh, formed uh, there. It's, uh, it's developed into a reasonable size track, but it's certainly not a Roman road. And here we are a bit further on, again, looking north, here's the track carrying on here. Now a bit wider, possibly to take a narrow cart, but it's not. Uh, there's no sign that uh, that looking like a Roman road at all there. However, just beyond this point, on the left-hand side, this is now looking south uh, there. There's this shelf, quite a pronounced shelf, uh, leading away from the road, started about 50 yards away from it, um, and uh, I thought that looks more promising uh, there. I did follow it for a short distance, but it led nowhere, and it didn't really look like part of a road in the end. Um, in his report of uh, 1899 uh, to the Cumberland and Westmoreland Excavation Committee, Francis Haddonfield uh, noted that there'd been a quarry called uh, Lode Pot Hole uh, on the north face of Lode Pot Hill, which this is. And it's possible that this shelf uh, and also the track might have had something to do with that. And I think actually the more I think about it, the more I look at things, I think that's probably right. It's probably something to do with the exit from the quarry. So, sure remains of a Roman road continue to remain elusive. Uh, perhaps in compensation, where I was, you get uh, a decent view, at least of uh, Oldswater. This is Oldswater down here. And you can see that I've climbed quite high up or, already there. Well, unfortunately, the signs, uh, any signs of a Roman road continued. The next hill after Lodepot Hill is Weather Hill. And the next shots were taken from it. This is looking north, so this is looking back to Lode Pot Hill. Again, you can see a track very clear. There's a sort of track over there as well, it seems to go over here. Uh, but there really no sign there of a Roman road. Uh, and equally, on the next, look in the opposite direction, is looking towards the next uh, hill, which is Raven Crag. Again, the uh, track is here, that's not as distinct, but still no sign whatever of a Roman road there. The change in colour, by the way, is my attempt to compensate for a bad exposure. Uh, the, that, that wasn't heather, it was more uh, brown grass uh, there. I, before, I, there are some more slides which show rather uh, uh, sudden changes of lighting though, and uh, I'll just explain what that is. Uh, and this is because on my way out, uh, that's a way from north heading this way, uh, towards High Street, uh, what had turned out as a nice bright sunny day had worked off into a thunderstorm uh, later in the day with lightning flashing in the valley beneath uh, there. In fact the lightning was flashing down here beneath me. It was quite exciting uh, there. And so you'll notice those sudden changes of abrupt changes of weather in some of the slides because I took some of them going and some of them coming back. Right, so now we've caught past Lode Pot Hole, we're up past Weather Hill itself, and now going on towards the next crag, uh, which is Red Crag itself uh, there. Uh, and a long last, something showed up there. I was <laughs> very grateful for this. It's clearly man-made, uh, and if anything, it's wider than the Western Main Road, which we sure saw on Bottom Head Fell. 
And uh, naturally, I was very excited at the time, but I've grown more cautious since. The surface is flat, as you can see, and not particularly tufted grass, and the ditches, the sides are really quite sharp here. This is looking north again to work towards um, uh, Weather Hill uh, there. But what it, uh, whatever it was, uh, has some age though, because on the next slide, um, you can, this, is, this slide has taken, the other, last slide was taken just there, this slide has taken, looking in the same direction, looking north, and you can see that it's run under this stone wall uh, there. But on balance, I'm now inclined to doubt that it is a road, or even a, a Roman road anyway, and I wonder if it had more to do with peat cutting. Um, this again is the view looking north here. Really, about half a mile further on, beyond Red Crag, Crag which is just here, uh, there, uh, then begins a, a very stiff climb up here onto High Rays. We still haven't got to High Street yet, but looking back towards Red Crag, another man-made feature appears. Although some people might find it a bit hard to spot on their screens, I don't know if we'd be able to do that. If the feature is here, it's a hollow way, running just there, it runs under the road, under the wall, and it runs just down here. I've uh, arrowed it to try and to make it a bit easier for people to see where it is there. Not clear on the ground. With the eye of faith, you might imagine that it's running up here as well, um, uh, underneath us there. But I think that's possibly just the, uh, <laughs> the eye of faith. But anyway, uh, a bit further on, what's interesting to see is that Holloway then turns into this quite pronounced cutting. Uh, this is the, where the Holloway was before. It's come across here. And now it's running up to this quite pronounced uh, cutting. Uh, they're still facing uh, north here. Uh, but also looking south at the cutting, you get this shape here. And uh, that, um, I, I could believe that that's Roman. It's got the sort of profile uh, I could expect uh, for a Roman uh, road. Or bit, it's rather narrow uh, there for a narrow one. Well, following the cutting, um, this uh, track then carries on across the western shoulder of High Rays. Uh, it's now looking, I'm now looking back north again after that cutting, so we're now heading, no, so we're heading this way, we're now looking this way. Um, and you can see that it's now turned into a, a shelf, which is largely uh, um, more than, looks a little more than just clearing the gravel off the surface and heaping it into a little edge here. Uh, we'll see the reason for that edge in a bit uh, there. But uh, it's, it's, it's not so much a hollow way now, it's just a sort of uh, a closed off uh, or scratched off uh, terrace way. Uh, this is a little further on and you can see that it's degenerated a lot. It's still there, um, but it's not nearly as wide and looking very scrappy. Uh, there. Well, high raise is just here. Uh, there, um, and it stands at 2,634 feet, which is 802 meters which is slightly less than High Street itself. However, before we get to High Street, you've got a, a drop of over 200 feet uh, around the head of Riggendale, which is this, this valley here, uh, and then down here into a saddle before climbing up onto High Street uh, just here. Um, and on this downward slope of High Rays just here, this came into sight. You see very clearly, Holloway, and a wide one too, running across here. It's clearly man-made. Um, um, but the difficulty is its profile. It's uh, it's a Holloway. It's 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 quite unlike any Roman road that I'd seen at the time or or since, for that matter. The closest parallel to it that I've come across is that of General Wade's military roads in Scotland. Uh, this is a picture of General Wade's, the very first road built by General Wade uh, in either 1726 or 1727. It's coming up after crossing the River Spean, which means where these trees are deep down in that valley there. And it's on its way uh, just to the north of uh, Fort William. So Fort William's off the end of the screen here. And it's on its way up here into the Great Glen uh, on its way to Fort Augustus, about 50 miles uh, distant in the past there. Now, as you can see, the road's been uh, dug out to the underlying gravel or the rock occasionally, and then the excavated material heaped up on either side. And that's, that's not just true here, it's true all the way along. It's the standard method of construction. And it seemed to me a, a, a most inappropriate uh, form of road construction, especially for all weather use. 
The road is going to be the first thing to fill up in snow. And when it's basin-like shape, uh, is going to retain water. So after a frosty morning, it's going to be an ice rink. However, you might have thought that uh, General Wade would have learned from this, but uh, all of his roads were constructed like this. Uh, and to a lesser extent, many of the military roads in Scotland, which were built by a successor, Major Caulfield, uh, were built in the same way as well. Well, if you've seen uh, Roman roads in contrast, tended to be built up above the ground and to be cambered so that the rain ran off it. Uh, there. So to return to high rays, um, one way in which this might have been formed is if somebody had erected fences here just to guide crowds, say with those fairs that they were organising here, fence either side here, then uh, the movement of uh, crowds would have been uh, safe. They wouldn't have you know, strayed over the side here and dropped off. Um, and it's possible that uh, you know, the wear and tear of movements of people uh, and animals, lots of animals and sheep and uh, horses and so on there, would have created hollowways, which was given, given rise to this sort of you know, nice steady uh, width uh, Roman road. However, that's just one possibility and uh, no doubt there are others as well there. Anyway, after uh, crossing the uh, head of, uh, after crossing, sorry, leaving High Rays, we now go around the head of Riggingdale, where the road gets quite clear uh, here. You can see it is quite a, a width in front of us here, a sharp edge on this side, and the road's running along here and along here and all the way along here. Riggingdale itself is a very steep drop off the edge of the road here, so we're really not running around the head of the valley. Uh, there. This is this was a shot was taken when the thunderstorm was brewing. And so was this as well there. Again, the road spit further on, the road's cement, nice and wide, uh, fairly flat, appears to be just gravel scraped off the surface and laid along to produce some kind of edge uh, along here. And this is the head of Riggendale. This is the view looking down Riggendale, by the way. Um, uh, this is uh, Hawes Water, which is now partly a, a reservoir for Lanc uh, uh, Manchester Corporation, I think. Uh, uh, just a scenic view. Anyway, here we are running around the head of Riggendale. This is looking back uh, to the north, and you see the road here running quite clearly. Uh, and this was taken on the way out, so that's why it's uh, much brighter. But just after that, after the head of Riggendale, the road then loses its, its shape. It just becomes a rather amorphous track. There might have been some, perhaps a bit of excavation here. But by and large, it's just a track uh, they're running down. Uh, but as soon after that, it then enters this groove. Uh, which I think has undoubtedly caused by heavy traffic of animals and people around this narrow spot here. Uh, and this is part of the drop down to the saddle of, uh, down here before the road then climbs up to High Street, uh, which is up, up here. Here's a view standing back from that groove, there's the groove, and here you can see the rise after the saddle climbing up to High Street, running all the way up here, uh, and also a branch road, which I'll mention later, running over here uh, there as well. Up there. Um, this is a view looking back from High Street, so I'm taking it from about here, looking back this way. Um, and here you can see the road heading round ahead of Riggendale, coming across here, going through the groove, running over the saddle here, and running up then towards us, to running up to High Street behind me. And this bit here, I, I could see that, that bit there looks to me like it could have been Roman. Uh, there. Um, it's one of the other uh, places like this. Uh, there. Anyway, so um, just want to show my place right here. Yeah, this is the view in uh, uh, snow uh, there, and you can see that the course of the road, particularly with the sharp edge, makes the road very clear uh, to see in uh, in in snow, and that would have been a boon in winter, especially in blizzards. Um, uh, there. Um, Yeah, here we are now uh, on the map in this saddle, that's just here, uh, between the head of Riggendale and um, High Street. Um, and this is the, another view in snow, looking back uh, up from the saddle, and you can see the road carrying up there, clearly a made road, all the way up there, up to the top uh, there. And you can see the lower track, uh, which was clearly um, uh, man-made. Uh, the reason for why it was forsaken for this upper track here 
uh, was apparently that it became cut in two places. I, I can't see them here, but in two places at least, there were ravines cut across by water action. And that ravines got very deep. I mean, they're eight to 10 feet deep. Uh, and really it stopped anybody, any animals going across carts, certainly, and even the foot uh, pedestrians, it would have been precarious. So I think people were forced to create a new route running a bit higher up, uh, avoiding the water action uh, there. Um, now this next view is taken up here on the upper track, looking back north. So here we are looking back to uh, the Riggendale and so on. And here you can see the upper track and uh, you can see there's no sign of any construction here. It, it's simply been uh, formed by the feet of travellers over many years. However, uh, further along this upper track behind me, it's reported that part of it was straightened in the early 1800s for the horse racing that took place annually on High Street at the time. And hence this track must have existed by the early 1800s, if not before. And since it replaced the earlier track, this means the latter track here, uh, here must have been earlier. I think the lower track is this one, is this along here. Uh, forgive me, the picture was taken 50 odd years ago. Uh, I think that's the lower track uh, running along there. Well, and so we come to High Street itself. It's the high point just here. It stands at 2,719 feet, as I said before, I think, and 828 metres, and it's the highest point on the route. Well, after all the climbing of the road across uh, towards our High Street, uh, the road across it is something of an anticlimax. Um, it doesn't go over the top at all, it doesn't need to. Instead, it runs along the western edge of the high ground. So the high ground is over here to the right, uh, and here we've got the road. This is looking north. Quite a wide road again here, uh, quite noticeably uh, made. Uh, there. Um, and uh, yeah, let's, let's look back to where we come from. A bit further on, this is viewing the other direction, looking south, and you see the road again, quite wide here, quite well made, a ridge running along this edge here, this side. Um, but it's still essentially a terrace way scooped from the, um, from the roadside. There's no real signs of construction there. And about half a mile further on, Again, looking uh, south, the road uh, loses its uh, identity here, really, but you can see it, I think, uh, running along here, and then it uh, doesn't, you know, that's a modern track running up there. It then curves here um, and runs, I think, across here, staying on the uh, eastern flank of this hill here, uh, there. And what's interesting, of course, that somebody thought it was worthwhile to build a gate uh, through the stone wall at this point. Um, so somebody was been busy uh, there. Uh, what the road's doing here, it's staying on the lower side of this cra next crag, which is uh, Thornthwaite Crag. Uh, let's show where that is. So uh, Thornthwaite Crag is about here, and this road is staying on the eastern side of it, just about here. Uh, the track uh, was clearly made for people who wanted to travel, uh, not for sightseers. And by that I mean that sightseers tracks would inevitably make for the highest point uh, here and uh, I'm, uh, I'm on High Street. Whereas this track over High Street uh, runs no higher than it has to. It meant people with a job, job of travelling. Well, this is a view looking south from uh, uh, Thornthwaite Crag uh, there. And the track uh, runs here, runs from here. Let's get it running along here. And then it runs here across the shoulder of this hill. And then starts just here, the descent uh, down to down Scotts Rake, running down into this valley here, the valley of the Hag Gill. I've called it places Trout and Big Beck Valley. It doesn't actually become join the Trout Beck Valley, which is over here, until it gets to the other side of this bump here, which is called the Tongue. Um, yes, and in the distance, you just might be able to make out here Lake Windermere. Uh, uh, well, this is an, another the places where the road, to me, I could believe for looking at that, that that is Roman. It does have a Roman look about it. Uh, but I'll, re I'll return that, um, uh, turn to that in a bit. Uh, anyway, just round the corner, just over the hump here, uh, there, the road turns into a well-made shelf, here it is, uh, but it looks uh, too recent to be Roman. I think that's quite, quite modern. This is the view looking south down the rake uh, there. And this is the same shelf further down, again, well-made shelf here. Uh, but it shows it's also getting extremely steep. It's actually here, from here, it runs down here, uh, along there. So it's incredibly steep uh, there. 
this is a little further down the hill where the, the steeper bit and you see here's the road running sorry about the curse is sticking um running along here and now it's become a hollow way quite wide uh, there but again not looking roman i think that's just caused by heavy traffic heavy uh, animal in the human traffic well this is where uh, scotch rake is on the map it's here running down into the dropping into the valley uh, apparently, the road descends a thousand feet in three quarters of a mile, which is 305 meters in 1.2 kilometers, according to Collingwood. He says it's got an average gradient of one in four, but uh, it's a lot steeper than that in places uh, there, believe me. Well, uh, here you're looking up, uh, you can see that the um, lower track, here's the uh, Scott Drake running along here. But here you can see a lower track has branched off uh, there, uh, run up here. Um, this is off the main track. It's typical of when people and animals have to climb up very steep hillsides and sometimes find a less pain, painful or punishing trail uh, there. This is a view looking down that lower track and uh, you can see it's, it's formed quite well, but that's, that's, I don't think there's any real signs of construction there, maybe there. I think that's more just wear and tear from, um, from, from, from the uh, traffic uh, on it there. This next shot, uh, I'm not sure about it. According to my notes, it's where the lower track and the uh, uh, higher track meet, but I'm not sure that's right. Generally, the, uh, the, the, the track here is quite wide. Um, you know, conceivably, I could believe that might be Roman there, uh, a little bit uh, there. Um, anyway, apologies for the uncertainty about that. Well, a bit further on, this is the last vestige of the track uh, where it gets to the bottom of the Scots Rake. Uh, uh, you might be able to see it. It's here, running around, and it runs around here, and then runs down here and around here. I've arrowed it so you can see it more, more clearly. So here it is running down here, around here, down here, and then just down there. As you can see, it's much narrower here um, and beyond here at this point there's nothing this there's, there's trap just stops and there's nothing but sloping hillside and i think what's happened here is the hillside over time has gradually run down onto the track and narrowed what was there before um, this is the valley of the Haggill here and this is the tongue uh, on the right hand side um the next shot's taken from the floor of the valley looking up over here um and here we can see the scotch rake climbing up the side of the hill. You can see how, how steep it is in places. Uh, once again, I've, put, I've arrowed it to make it perhaps a little clearer to see. So it's running here, up here, and here. And you can see beneath here, there's nothing, no, no sign of a made road uh, down there. It's just bare hillside uh, there. Well, um, the Ordnance Survey map shows the footpath that uh, uh, this is marked as a footpath. Um, uh, uh, running all, all the way uh, down the valley of the Hat Gill, but I could find almost no sign of any uh, constructed road. There is a, a possible cutting um, just about here, uh, just at this point. Um, here it is. Uh, I don't. I, I think I may be grasping at straws, frankly. Um, I'm not sure whether it really is man-made cutting or not, but it looks like it could have been. Uh, there. But here, by the way, you can see bits of the uh, Scots Rake climbing up here uh, on the shelf there. But uh, going down the valley, I, I, saw, I saw no signs of any road construction uh, there uh, at all, there, or Roman road construction. There is a track on the eastern side of the valley, which I, uh, I followed for a bit. It's marked a port footpath. And you see here, there is a yeah, reasonable shelf uh, just here. Uh, there, But it doesn't, it's narrow here. It doesn't look Roman to me, I'm afraid, uh, there. Uh, also, uh, past the tongue, this is the head of the tongue, we're now getting into trout, uh, the Troutbeck Valley. Uh, I did find this sort of shelf, if you like, beside this well-built stone road, stone wall. But uh, I, I think I'm just grasping at straws. I don't think that's really uh, anything there. Uh, and then just a bit further, opposite the village of Troutbeck itself, there's this quite striking uh, footpath uh, climbing up the valley side here. And this might have uh, uh, spurred um, R.G. Cronwood um, to um, well, predict uh, that the road uh, would have gone uh, this way to the east 
uh, climbed out of the valley and then headed for the Roman fort at um, Watercook near Kendall, about, uh, about 10 miles away from here. However, this, this track, when I looked at it, is uh, it's not Roman, uh, however. So to return to the original question, um, is it Roman? Well, as I declared at the outset, when I walked the road back in 68 and took the pictures, I had no reason to question the belief that the road was Roman. All I was doing was photographing it uh, to show what was there and examine how the roads had built a road over such difficult country. It was only later, prompted by Tom Clare's question, that I came to have doubts. And uh, with a gradual accumulation of experience in following Roman and uh, non-Roman roads, uh, I now believe, uh, from looking at the photographs again, there are only two or three places along the route where the appearance of the road might allow it possibly to have been a Roman construction. Elsewhere, the remains which are visible seem to me, be to be those of a much more modern road, by which I mean some, something like 300 years uh, old, not 2000 years. So what might be the um, context uh, of such a Roman road? Well, to the north, there's a Roman fort at Broome uh, here, just, just by the A66, just up there. Um, and a number of writers have confidently stated that the Roman road uh, started from there and then ran through the village of Yanworth, just up here, uh, and uh, then uh, went past two other villages not shown, called uh, Tyrrell and Celerum, before starting the climb here onto higher ground um, on the uh, towards High Street. But there's actually no evidence to support this, and David Ratledge reports that there's been no trace at all to be seen of such a line on LIDAR images uh, there. Well, to the south, there were Roman forts at Watercrook, uh, near Kendall, which is down here at the end of the Kent Valley, off the picture. Uh, and uh, also one at Ambleside, just here, which is to the south. Uh, but this route to Scots Rake doesn't look uh, to be designed to service either of them. Um, from the map, if you're heading for Watercrook, it looks as if your better course would be to go this way, head off down the Kent Valley, uh, which is the Kent runs into uh, Kendall, and reach the uh, fort that way. And if you were going to go to uh, the Fort Ambleside, it looks like a better route would have been to have kept the height on here, crossed over, and then run down this valley to pick up the uh, Kirkston Pass and run into uh, Ambleside that way. So it doesn't look very likely uh, in terms of Roman planning, but that was really uh, the intention of uh, any Roman intention. Well, might there have been Roman mining interests along High Street? Now, R.G. Collingwood states uh, flatly that there weren't, but I gather there's been a recent publication on the internet or somewhere in social media claiming the existence of iron workings on High Street. So I discuss this with Steve Hedworth. Uh, I believe he's watching tonight, by the way. Hello, Steve. Uh, thanks for the feedback. And uh, Steve's not only a member of the Northern Archaeology Group, but also a retired, retired for former miner. And he reports that there are mineral seams which appear to cross High Street. So the potential for mining is there. But he's seen no signs of Roman spoil tips when looking at the air in Google Earth. And uh, so he, he's actually doubtful that, that actually there was serious mining there. He does admit, though, that a detailed investigation on the ground is required to be more certain, but he thinks it's, it's not really very likely. So what have the authorities, the great archaeologists, said, stated about the road? Well, as I mentioned, um, High Street, the name, is a most untypical name for a hill. And elsewhere in Britain, it's uh, often an indicator that Roman road is nearby. Nevertheless, it's not a proof. And although the hill's unusual name appears to have existed from at least the Middle Ages uh, there, it's interesting to note that the route across it uh, was not projected to be a Roman road until the early 1800s. Before that, people didn't seem to think it was a Roman road. It's also interesting to see that the first map of this postulated Roman road was produced by the antiquarian John uh, Hodgson in 1828. And it doesn't show it going down Scott's Rake. He shows it running more this way, along here, across uh, Frosick and Ill Bell uh, there. And I'll return to that, this possibility shortly. Uh, later, uh, Francis Haverfield, reporting to the Cumberland and Westmoreland Antiquarian and Archaeological Society, what a mouthful, uh, in 1899, uh, provided details of two excavations which have been carried out across the northern part of the road. I think that's roughly up here where the excavations took place. Uh, 
Um, however, he makes it clear that he wasn't present himself at the excavations. And the stats of his reporting, the reporting of others of the excavations, uh, seems, well, appears to me, to be discreetly non committal. He mentions that stone uh, found in the excavations appears to have come from a quarry and load pot hole. That's just about here. Um, but he adds, tellingly, I think, that this probably happened, and I quote his words, at some time or other. So I'm not sure he was convinced it was a Roman road. Now, R.G. Collingwood uh, reported to the Cumberland and Westmoreland Society in 1937, and he declared himself in favour of the roads being Roman. But I must say, uh, reading his report, I, I, I found it very weak. I, I thought the arguments were invalid. I thought his comparisons were dubious. And I thought his conclusions were spurious uh, there. I, I was really surprised at this because I thought that Colin would have been one of the big names amongst the archaeologists of his time. Now, Thomas Hay, reporting to the same society a year later, uh, patently disagreed with Collingwood's verdict, but he seemed a bit shy of contradicting uh, his illustrious uh, associate uh, openly. Perhaps his most telling statement was, and again I'll quote uh, literally, uh, what is far more noticeable than the presence of metalling in certain places is its total absence in many others. Uh, it suggests that the road may in fact have been a pre-Roman track which was patched up by the Romans where necessary, but it was never metal throughout. And in fact, you can see from what I've seen on it, of it, that might actually be a plausible um, explanation of what was going on. The difficulty is though, it, this implies that the track was already in existence when the Romans arrived. And I think its sharp edge indicates that it's much more recent than that. So moving on in time, uh, Ivan Margery's account of the road in his book, uh, The Roman Roads in Britain, uh, includes a photograph uh, of it on Brown Rig, which is on the northern part of the route. It's about up here, uh, there. Okay. And it does indeed look like a very convincing picture of a Roman road. Uh, for those who want to look it up, the photographs is plate 13A in the 1973 edition of his book. That was the last edition of his book, plate, plate 13A. Well, all I can say is that I, don't, I could spot nothing like that when I crossed the area. Uh, I, I was looking um, in, well outside, on either side of the road when walking on it as well, of course, and also looking at it in both directions. And I saw nothing like that uh, there. And what I did see, of course, as you've seen, were some bridges on the ground that might look like a Roman road in certain conditions and from some particular viewpoints. Anyway, moving on further, uh, the late John Peterson was Britain's leading expert on the Roman practice of centuriation. Now, uh, centuriation was a way of parceling up uh, the landscape into a network of squares, uh, typically uh, in metric 710 by 710 metres. Uh, in imperial measurements, that's 776 by 776 yards. The Romans did this principally for the allocation of plots for farming. However, as John Peterson said several times, once the Romans had marked out the land in this way, the grid could also be used for setting out the lines of roads, as shown in this diagram. You can see here the road uh, is running between these grids uh, here, the intersection of the grids here and here and here. It's, uh, if you like, one, two up and one across, two up and one across, and so on there. And then the road uh, changes direction and uh, when the destinations come into view. Okay, uh, and clearly with if this grid's big, big enough, you can carry on this building a dead straight road for as long as you like. It's a very good way of doing it. But John Peterson also noted that the roads could sometimes jump one or more grids, uh, items on the grid, as shown here. Let's have a look at this. So here you've got a road uh, running across the grid here, in this case one across and uh, three down. And then for some reason it jumps across to here and follows the same uh, alignment, same grid, same pa uh, parallel alignment, but on a different part of the grid. So it running across here, again, one across and three down. And John called this a uh, bayonet form of road construction. And in a paper published in 2006, John proposed that the road over High Street uh, was an example of a road set out on bayonet form. He was plotting it against what he believed was a grid set out across High Street, the grid of centuriation. And you can see it running here through the sectors of the grid. Then when it gets past uh, Riggendale, it has to curve around the saddle onto High Street, it loses the grid there, naturally. 
and then gradually resumes it as he gets past Frosic, and then, sorry, gets past uh, Thornthwaite Crag, and then resumes the grid here. Um, and this grid is slightly to the, uh, to the west of the grid that this was being followed here. So this, this would have been the original grid just here. Okay. Um, I, by the way, I ought to apologize because I don't have John's permission to reproduce this diagram. I'm afraid he is dead. But uh, I'm sure uh, he'd have uh, no objection at all to my showing you this, but, uh, so you're aware of it. But unfortunately, I, I think this is an instance of theory overriding practicality for, for, for two reasons, really. If centuriation was primarily intended for the allocate land for farming, then why on earth would the Romans have gone to the trouble of setting up such a scheme of centuriation over the hills and remote valleys of the Lake District, especially over something like High Street? You know, somewhere like the Vale of York, yeah, that would seem likely to have been a place for more centuriation. But uh, I hear it just seems balmy. Um, and on top of that, this grid is a perfectly square grid on the horizontal plane. Now, how on earth do you set out a grid like that when a lot of the hillside around here are nearly vertical? Uh, there? Well, I think the Romans would have found out how to do it. So the Ordnance Survey did eventually, of course. But although I have great respect for John's intelligence and mathematical ability and, and his uh, degree of rigor, which he applied to uh, the evidence when he examined it, I think he was wrong with this one. Uh, I don't, don't think it's uh, uh, realistic. The uh, other investigation which was carried out and published in 2006 was by uh, Green Lane Archaeology of Olverston. We'd been engaged by the um, Lake District National Park Authority to excavate a short length of the possible Roman road just to the south of Thornthwaite Crag. Let's bring this back to this picture here. Now, if I've understood the uh, uh, Green Lane's um, uh, uh, report, and I've met, read the maps correctly, I've understood where I'm standing. And I think what they did was put a trench across the road here, a trench across the road just here before it turns, and then a trench across here just after it's turned. There, there. Um, I think that's right. My apologies to Relane if I've read that wrongly. Uh, there. But uh, as you can see, that's quite close to where I thought this look, did look like, or could have looked like uh, a Roman road. So what a Green Lane found? Well, really, it was a, pretty much what I'd found all the way past Biggendale over High Street and below Thornthwaite Crag. It was just a shallow shelf, loosely covered with gravel and pebbles. No Roman material came up, but, and Green Lane agreed uh, with my assessment. This was an uh, untypical form of construction for a Roman road. Nevertheless, unlike me, they were still prepared to believe the road probably was Roman. Uh, possibly with the thought in mind that uh, who else would have built a road up here. They also felt, though, that the Scotch Rake would have been impractically steep for a Roman road, and that as mapped by Hodgson, the Roman road may have continued over Frosic and Hill Bell, which I mentioned earlier, and descended via the Kentmere Horseshoe. In fact, they uh, titled their report to call it Kentmere Horseshoe. In other words, they thought that the Roman road would have gone across over here and carried on well, presumably up the side, we go over the top of Frosic uh, and up here over Ill Bell. <laughs> it was a bit intimidating, wasn't it? Um, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, their terms of engagement didn't let them test that possibility out. They had to stick to this road uh, here. And of course, I was unaware of the Hodgson's work when I was inspecting the road myself, so I didn't examine it either. So we've got a clear difference of opinion there. And my question is what, to, what could be said about it? Well, Green Lane's archeologists are professionals. They'll have spent several days examining one part of the road in considerable depth to detail. Whereas my assessment's based on a retrospective analysis, a photograph, which I took on a single day's visit or two single day's visits. Um, uh, and on the other hand, I did examine the route from end to end uh, there and back. And I've been following Roman and uh, non-Roman roads uh, over high ground for nearly 60 years now. And I think I know what other signs to look for. In addition, there's the point that if, if the Green Lane archaeologists are right, and the Roman road did go on here, then at least the trench they put across the road here wouldn't have been uh, cutting across the road. But it seemed on their excavations with pretty much the same road as this one, the same road as they found up here. Uh, so I'm sticking to my guns. Um, 
I think that what I saw in the photograph was not a, a Roman construction. I think it's much more likely to have been something built, say, 300 years ago. Uh, nevertheless, I can recommend Green Range Report. It's full of relevant information and it can be downloaded free of charge from the Archaeology Data Service in York. York. Remember, it's called, where are we? The uh, Kentmere Horseshoe. Now, just before I close, uh, there's a couple of items of stock press, uh, which I think I ought to just go in and fill you in about. These are a couple of recent developments, which I only learned about two to three weeks ago. Uh, the first is that Historic England uh, has a project to examine all of the traces of the routes over High Street, including the possible Roman road. I didn't know anything about that. The investigation is intended to, now let's see if I can get this right, to trial uh, photogrammetric modeling using a camera setup in a light aircraft. So there. Um, and it's accompanied by uh, some drone surveys, yes, and a limited amount of observation via boots on the ground. The work had actually begun before the virus struck, but that clobbered it. Um, so it's largely been on a hold since, although it's hoped to resume progress over the months ahead, I understand. But I also understand that so far, no signs of Roman road construction have been identified. But clearly this is work which is still ongoing. The second development, um, uh, again, we learned about this two or three weeks ago, is that LIDAR data has uh, now been made publicly available uh, for the entire route over High Street. And uh, David Ratledge, um, who's made so many discoveries about uh, Roman roads in Britain using LIDAR, has taken advantage of this to look for any signs of a Roman road along the route. And I'm very grateful for doing this because he, he took time off for the other things that he was doing, knowing that I was giving this talk in three weeks' time, and he spent a day searching over the entire area with the LIDAR uh, there, just to see if uh, there was anything. Well, he's informed me uh, that he's found nothing that looks like a typical Roman road, and nor has he spotted any evidence of what there is, uh, is Roman down there. Uh, there's a bit more stock press, though, for a nice surprise, really, uh, if we can get it to work. Um, uh, David's about two or three days ago let me know that he's uh, formed a video flyover, LIDAR flyover, over the entire course of um, High Street. And uh, if we manage to get this right, I'll try to show this uh, immediately after the end of uh, this talk. Uh, the, I can tell you it's a lot easier uh, doing it on LIDAR than it is on foot. Uh, but just to conclude my uh, talk uh, there. Um, if there's a hole in my position, it's that I've never had the time, either before or afterwards, to carry out a full reconnaissance of the area, particularly in the northern and southern ends, that's you know, around here, for instance, of the area, uh, to see if there's any evidence of Roman construction, which is away from the Ordnance Survey's track. Uh, but in the meantime, yes, people undoubtedly walked over High Street in Roman times, and yes, some of them will have been Roman soldiers. But did they, build, did they build a road over it? I think not. Well, here I'll stop screen sharing and see if we can stop play um, uh, David's LIDAR video before uh, taking going on to questions there. So excuse me a moment. Now let's see if I can um, go on to yeah, David's video. I should point out David's working here from north to south, so he's at the same direction as I uh, showed the pictures uh, to. So that's Hoopstar Hill uh, on the left. Climbing up over Brown Rig. And there's that quarry I was mentioning earlier. There's the shelf I think I was looking at.
That's Lou Pot Hill. I think that peat cutting started. And there's traces of that hollow road. It's a drop off to off high rays. Now go by Riggendale. Over the saddle and up High Street. High Street itself. Thorntwaite Crag just here. And here's that road curving off and starting to go down Scotts Rake. You better grab parachutes here because it's going to be getting very steep. And that's, that's David's uh, e uh, website if you want to visit it. Uh, the video isn't uh, publicly available yet, but it will be after this talk, I understand. Uh, there. But thank you very much for um, David uh, there. Um, uh, thank you very much for doing that. Uh, uh, no, so back, Mike, back to you, I think, there, if you can hear me. Uh, yes, thank you very much, David. Um, hope everybody can hear me fine i'm just going to have a look at my emails to see what uh, notifications i've got of any questions um elizabeth if you can hear me i'm not actually oh here we go i was looking at the wrong account i was just about to say i ain't got any but i have i should have known elizabeth would be much more efficient than that okay Right, we do have quite a few questions coming in. Um, first of all, I, I really do want to thank John for that. I, what I liked about it was that the photographs he showed were taken a good time ago. Um, if you go up there recently, a, a, a lot of those shots have changed substantially due to erosion, unfortunately. Um, but it enabled us to get a sense of, of what was there in the 60s. It was excellent. Right. Um, just bear with me one second while I change my view. That's better. Uh, I can now see John. Right. Are you ready to go, John, with some questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Right, no problem. Okay. From Penny Jackson. Um, a good question. Are large cuttings common on old but non Roman roads? Hmm. Uh, yes, yes, they are. Yeah, I hadn't thought much about it. But yes, I've seen quite a few uh, there. Uh, a large cutting doesn't mean a Roman road. <laughs> no, it certainly doesn't. Um, the the one thing with Roman cuttings, not all, not, not, not just Roman cuttings, but certainly Roman cuttings, will maintain a steady gradient generally through the cutting and out of it either side. Mm. And if it's not doing that, then it almost certainly isn't Roman. Mm. That's really the only thing I would add. Um, next one from John Bowman. Whilst High Street is very exposed, would it be much drier during the winter? Um, also, from the security point of view, would there be much less chance of ambush? Um, <laughs> well, they'd be out of breath when they took the time they got there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, it's, it's a good uh, route for the, you could see a long way around there. I don't think there'd be many trees up there in Roman times there. Um, I didn't think the road was particularly wet when I was walking over it, really. Uh, there, um, and of course, in winter, I mean, it'll be snowed up. I mean, you've probably got several, three or four months of snow being up there. Uh, on the track, which again I think explains that sharp edge. It's you know you don't want to wander off there in a snowstorm. 
And regard, um, as far as chances of ambush are concerned? Well, um, slim up there, I think. Uh, I would have thought slim. Um, there is actually a point that, that comes to mind here. Um, it was actually the, the late Hugh Toller, I remember, used to mention this quite a lot. Um, Roman roads do not tend to run along ridges for very good reasons. If you're walking along a ridge, you can be very, very clearly seen silhouetted against the skyline. So even though you might not be ambushed, people would know that you were there and exactly know where you were going. Mm. Um, although it doesn't, it's just under the ridge, isn't it? Rather than actually, strictly speaking, on it, if I'm right, John? Uh, I've never actually been up, believe it or not. Yeah, in places it's actually on top, but, uh, yeah, right. yes, but it, okay. if it doesn't need to go over the top of the ridge, it doesn't. No. They're now coming in thick and fast um, from Di Johnston who says it may be completely unrelated, um, but locally the junction of the B5305 to the A595 in Wigton is known as Street Road End. I think this is a ref reference to street place names. 21 miles from Penrith and a short distance from Maglona. Um, the A595, of course, links Carlisle to Wigton uh, and Papcastle and onwards towards Maryport. Um, I, I, if I get the gist of this, of what Di's actually asking is, is really regarding the use of the word street and as to whether it, it always implies a Roman road or not. In the case that she's mentioning, it, it, it is referring, in a sense, to a Roman road, not always under the modern one. But um, is that something you have an opinion on, John, of the use of street? I know I certainly do, but it's, it's your talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but, but, yeah, much the same. I mean, if you see the word street, look around, there might be a Roman road uh, nearby. But don't assume it's a guarantee that there is a Roman road there. Um, so, you know, street itself could be just a, a place uh, that people walked on. I think that's how High Street got its name. It was, it was the way from the north to the south uh, across the Lake District. Yes. I mean, that's that's uh, that's certainly pretty much true as in, in my experience across most, most of Northern England. Um, where I am at the moment in North Yorkshire, just a couple of miles up the hill, I walk on it frequently, is Hamilton Street. Um, it may potentially be prehistoric. It's not a Roman road. It was certainly a drove road in the 13th century. We know that. Um, so I think you're right. Street was basically used for any possibly important, locally important road, but not necessarily Roman as we were all taught, taught at school. Um, moving on. <laughs> oh, I like this one. Yes. Um, how does this road score on Mike's rating system? This isn't really to you, John, it's more to me. <laughs> um, I have actually answered this to, to the, I don't have a name, I have tab one stack, so I'm afraid I don't actually know the name of who that is. Um, from what I know of High Street, um, for those who are familiar with my rating system, none of it would rate higher than one, which is possible. It's not ruled out, it's not ruled in, just possible. That's the best that any of it would do. Yes, can I chip in there, Mike? Just yes, to make certainly. Point that, that, you know, there's a, there's a difference between the Romans using a way which might already exist mm -hmm. and build, building a road. Uh, so they may well have walked on that on over High Street umpteen times there uh, and for, for, for troop manoeuvres probably as well. But uh, actually building a road is a different kettle of fish. And I think that that distinction perhaps needs to be brought out. Uh, that, it is a very, very important distinction, John. I think there's a couple of questions actually relating to that later on. So yeah. if, if we move onwards from now. Um, from Joe Lewis. Evening, Joe. Um, Joe was one of our speakers last year. Um, have you seen the report from the excavation uh, investigation of part of the High Street Roman Road in Kentmere by Samuel Whitehead and Dan Daniel... Daniel W. Ellsworth. I think you referred to that, actually, John. Uh, no, not, not that report. Did you not? The, the, uh, the Greenland uh, archaeology report, yes. Ah, sorry, my mistake. Yeah, yeah but uh, no, the other one, I didn't, I didn't know of it. Uh, the apologies. Um, they conclude that the road surface is not typical, but does have similarities to other roads of Roman date, um, e.g. north of Lodepot Hill, um, for which the site have a field in 1898. Um, it is on ADS again. Um, hmm. Yeah, it sounds like it's the same kind of road that if I was looking at so most of the way uh, from what over High Street and Thornthwaite Crag. Yeah, um, for anybody for anybody who might be interested in looking at that, I'm just going to put it um, onto if I can get chat to come up. Here we go. 
Um, I'm just going to put that up to everyone. Type that link in. And there it is for anybody who wants it. Thanks, Joe. And next. Right, here we go. Um, from John Beaumont. The trackway may be prehistoric, improved where required by the Romans, as many others were, and improved further in later centuries, hence the sharp edge in places. Um, and then there's a quite a late, we'll, we'll deal with that one first. Um, there's another one from Andrew Tibbs after, which sort of touches on the same thing, but we'll um, just deal with that one first. It's a comment rather than a question. Yeah, well, it's possible. I mean, let's see, if, if, if an area was walked in prehistoric times, there would be some kind of track there. But I think uh, what I saw in terms of manu manufacturing was um, pretty uh, certainly no more than about 300 years old. Mm. Yes, yeah. Um, there's an assumption in that comment, and it's an assumption that we see a lot, that many that a lot of Roman roads were built along pre-existing trackways. In actual fact, there's precious little evidence for that. We have a couple. There's the very well-known one in, Sh in Shropshire, Sharpston Hill, um, which is definite. There's another one north of Leeds, at Adel, um, and there, there are a couple, I think, in East Anglia, but I, I can't remember the details for the life of me. But um, actual evidence of that being done is, is quite slim, even though it is often assumed. Um, Yes, I uh, I concur with that. Yeah, the alignments I've looked at on Roman roads, they were just laid out across the landscape. Yes, uh, they might be the same general direction. We didn't take any notice. Yeah, well, that's we'll we'll, we'll come to that. Uh, moving on to Andrew Tibbs's comment, it strikes me that given the height and steep inclines of many sections of High Street, it would be a fairly impractical route for the army to use, given that goods and goods and supplies would be moved using animals and carts. Some sections are far too steep for heavy carts to be pulled up. Um, I suspect that lower routes such as via Glendinning would be more suitable for the military. Therefore, I wonder if High Street is either a pre-Roman trackway, as it seems intended for use by those on horseback or on foot, or could it be post-Roman in part, constructed by Norse settlers who built many of the walls high upon the fells to delineate their territories? quite a few things in there first of, um, he, he touches on the uh, pre-roman trackway being reused again um and as you said yourself that's certainly a possibility um yeah yeah i um i my guess with the walls i've not done the research but my guess with the walls are they're victorian and okay. I, I think the evidence on the ground that i saw suggests that it's only about 300 years old uh, there i don't think it's norman uh, there or viking Okay. I can't really add much to that as it's not my area. One thing I would say with regard to the, the prehistoric um, part potentiality of it, um, both David Ratledge and I have recently been looking at the prehistoric precursor of the A66 effectively before the Roman road was built over the stain wall. Um, and there is substantial evidence of the prehistoric route. But what's interesting about it is the amount of, um, it's usually termed braided trackway, where you get one holloway cutting across another one and then another one. And it looked from above, it looks like a, a braided rope very often. Um, looking at David's flyover of High Street, there were a few short areas where you did have dense areas of, of such braiding. But a lot of that density wasn't actually on High Street at all. It was on another track that was cutting across it, mm -hmm. as I noticed as you went over. Mm -hmm. The width of braiding is nothing like the width that we're seeing on Stainwall. That's not in itself to say it's, it, it can't be prehistoric, but it does make you wonder how, how ancient some of that actually is. It's just an observation, really. Um, of course, there's virtually no way of dating braided trackways. They could be made in the 19th century. They could be prehistoric. In this case, who knows? Um, I'll move on because we're getting them still coming in. From Anna Gray now. I thought the road over the top at Ascombe Fell was originally called the Breet's Gate, um, i.e. the road of the Brits, and therefore of an earlier date than Roman. I have no, no knowledge at all there. Where, where is Ascombe Fell? Sorry. Um, it's not my part of the world, John, so I'll be honest, I don't actually know. Uh, right, well, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't help there, really. Um, 
No, uh, the, the name uh, High Street, I think it was called something, it, was, it wasn't exactly High Street, but it was something very like it. And that was in about, I think the earliest mention was about 1300, so mm -hmm. char charter somewhere, I think. Uh, there. Right. People have interpreted it as meaning high, being the same as High Street. Mm. Okay. Um, from somebody with no name who calls himself the power. Anyway, thank you, John, for an excellent talk. I agree with your theory that High Street was pre-Roman with Roman upgrades where needed. Um, the Ridgeway style utilizing high ground for security makes good sense. Um, Stone Age, let's say prehistoric man needed to get from A to B in a straight line as possible. And the lofty views would reveal um, uphill assailants to the traveler. Uh, well, that wasn't my conclusion. No. I... <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what I said was, no, I don't think it was a, a pre... It may have been a prehistoric track, um, but I don't think it was patched up by the Romans. I think what's there to be seen is, is much later. It may have been patched up much later, but uh, it's, uh, I don't think it's Roman. Um, I've just had um, an email sent through to me. Apparently, um, Askham Fell Circular is an eight and a half mile loop trail located near Penrith. That doesn't really tell me where Askham Fell is, but um, it must be somewhere near where we're talking about, presumably. Yeah, sorry, yes, I still don't know it, unfortunately. No. The name sounds familiar, but that's about, that's about it. Oh, it's at the northern end of the route, sometimes called Moor Divock. Oh, right. No, nope, don't know it. Sorry. <laughs> okay. And at the moment, actually, that's pretty much it. Um, if anybody else has got any more questions, by all means, continue to ask them. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Perhaps we might have a vote in a bit, uh, Mike. But, uh... Well, um, yeah, you did mention a vote and uh, right at the beginning. And if you recall, I'd completely forgotten all about it, which is my fault. Um, if Jeff is listening, I think it's Jeff who's hosting. Um, I've actually activated the ability to um have a vote but the host has to do it apparently don't ask me how i don't know i just changed the settings so that it was activated um, right well you've got me stumped there mike <laughs> <laughs> um i can try and find out but at the, as things stand at the moment i don't know how to do it i would have i would have guessed it would just come up as an option in the bottom bar but it's not on mine but as your host, it might have an extra one. I don't know. If it doesn't work, we've, we've still got 80 people present, so we can... Um... Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's not something that anyone's asked me to do. Right, I'll, I'll tell you all about <laughs> a, a simple, A simple solution, we will take a, we'll take a poll um, but we might have to give the results out on the website later. Um, I'll put it on the front page. Um, if everybody goes to the chat function, and for those who feel, based on the evidence that John has presented and the comments we've had afterwards, that it could be a properly uh, constructed Roman road, as opposed to just a road that the Romans may have potentially used, if you feel it's a proper Roman road, then put yes in the chat. That's all you need to do, just yes, one word. And if you don't, no. And we'll see how many responses we get. Well, I'm seeing them coming in and it's pretty conclusive. <laughs> so far, we've had two yeses, a maybe, and about 50 no's, and we've had not a cat Helms chance as well. So. I, th I think the view of the audience is a most definite and emphatic no, with one or two dissenters. Yeah. <clears throat> Just um, a, a quick word while they're still coming in um, on the issue, potential issue of it being used by the Romans or as was suggested by one questioner improved by the Romans the only way that you would have of proving that it was actually prehistoric 
was for a Roman feature to cut across it at some point. That is the only way you could do it realistically, as we currently don't have um, dating methods that are likely to be able to date such trackways, uh, not accurately anyway. Um, there is something called OSL that uh, won't go into that now, but it, it, it is possible with the right sampling, we might be able to use OSL to date trackways like High Street, although I'd be a bit skeptical personally. Um, I don't know, Andrew Tibbs will probably know more about that than me. I know they do it up at Durham. Um, if Andrew's still on, if he thinks it's a possibility, let us know. Nope. We appear to have, oh, it's a map of Ascombe Fell. <laughs> okay, so it's, yeah, it's on the early parts of the, as you're climbing up really to the southwest of Penrith near Ascombe. Um, obviously it's sort of east of Pooley Bridge, if that helps. Uh, it doesn't help me, I'm afraid. No. <laughs> Sorry there. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, um, even if I saw it on a map, I don't know the area, so I'd be hesitant about giving any opinions uh, there about that. I would like, while I'm on though, just to say uh, thank you to actually a number of friends who are not archaeologists who are obviously watching. I've just seen the names. And uh, thank you very much for, um, for watching. It's very kind uh, there. And thanks again, too, to David Ratledge for um, what well, advice and help he's given, and also for the, uh, like the video at the end as well. Mm, yes, and an excellent. His, his flyovers are excellent. Um, they really, really are. And it worked. We weren't sure it was going to. <laughs> well, we had a struggle at the start, yeah, but uh, yeah, <laughs> great. Um, I, I did make a couple of things notes myself. Let me just uh, see if there's anything that's relevant. I think we've covered them all actually. Um, oh yeah, there was just one. You were you when you were talking about potential centuriation mm -hmm. and um, John Peterson's work. You did mention the, that the Vale of York was exactly the sort of area you might expect it mm. although i do i just wanted to clarify very quickly that whilst herman ram did actually have some ideas about centuriation west of york there is not a scrap of evidence for it it's been pretty much discounted with what we know now about um, field systems um, in and around the vale of york so i just wanted to put put that in for clarification yes can, can i disagree there mike um, <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time, John. <laughs> <laughs> yes, lovely. Yes, I uh, I believe that the Romans did um, did start to set out a scheme of centuriation across the Vale of York, no, we, and, no. and never implement, implemented it. Um, the reason for that is that the Roman road going over Blubber Houses Moor yeah. uh, is exactly parallel to the alignment, the long distance alignment from Kirkham to Alborough. And I don't see how the Romans could have done that unless they weren't following a grid. They may have followed the grid by accident. They may have thought they'd turn into Alborough and got it wrong uh, there. But uh, I think they may have started to uh, put a scheme of injuriation in place, which with a for fortress they'd expected. But uh, then the fact they never achieved it, okay, fair enough. But I think there is a possibility they did start uh, to put a grid yes. there. Yeah. I will accept the possibility. We, we've, we've had this conversation several times over the years, yeah? <laughs> ah, yes, and, uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. I think there'll be a mention of it in the itinerary. In the, uh, yes. And uh, that is definitely the end of the questions, I think. Um, oh, hang on a minute. We have something from Dave Went. Oh, yes. Which has just come up. Um, uh, thanks, Dave, for uh, emails. Uh, and... Dave, I'll just read it out. The possible survival of a Roman route such that it formed a significant marker in the medieval landscape was first noted by the Reverend Frederick Ragg in 1910, implied within by a grant of 1220 to 1247 between William de Lancaster and his half-brother Roger, in which the term Breath Street is used to define a boundary following the high ground east of Oldswater. So this is the ref. I think this is the reference yes. that the the, yes. the comment what, and the question came up from. Remember. The stret or street element clearly relates to a paved stone. Sorry about that. Just had an interruption. A paved 
Elm or Stone Road, while breadth could mean it was considered either broad or British in origin. Of course, being considered it might have been British in origin in the 13th century does not mean that it was, it just means that they thought it might be. Uh, thanks for that, John. Very informative. Yeah, John, you. Dave. Yes, thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for watching. Do Apologies, Dave. Dave. <clears throat> OK, um, and following Dave's comment that I think this is to do with the vote. It says not a chance. I'm sure that's not relating to uh, Dave Wen's <laughs> comment as, as to whether it's a Roman road. <laughs> Another thing from Steve Hedworth, who you mentioned um, in your talk. Yes. Evening, Steve. If feet on the ground and sampling confirm significant mineralization, it may be a prehistoric trackway used by commercial interests. Otherwise, no way. Um, I'm quite sure what you're getting at there, to be honest. Um, it, 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 can you clarify that a bit, Steve? Just put another comment in. I'm not quite sure what you mean. If he's still with us. That was only five minutes ago, so. Anyway, while we're waiting for that. While that's coming, Mike, can I make the point that um, if it's any comfort to people who would like to believe it's a Roman road, uh, you can almost guarantee that for the next 40 years, every guidebook um, and uh, the old survey map and uh, lots of other uh, serious publications will carry on saying it's a Roman road uh, there. Indeed, uh, they will. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, uh, but some years ago, I published an article uh, on the Stain Gate, which showed that it couldn't have been built before 100, or at least unlikely to have been built before 105 AD. But you still read books telling you that it was built by Agricola 20 years earlier. <laughs> <laughs> it goes on and on and on. <laughs> so yeah. uh, <laughs> people who want to, to worry to visit the Fake Lake District and look at a possible Roman road, they should carry on having a look. <laughs> Yeah, well, we, we still face the same problems in Yorkshire where, of course, Agricola built absolutely everything. <clears throat> <laughs> anyway, we won't get into that one. <laughs> um, and we have Wade's Causeway, which is another, another, another one that's been claimed as a Roman road for such a long time and almost certainly is not. Um, but uh, English Heritage still have the signs up. Even though they're fully well aware of the, the work that pretty much proves, uh, Blaise Viner's work that pretty much proves it isn't. Um, right, there don't appear to be any more questions. Um, so that if, unless there's anything else anyone needs to say, I'm still hoping we get something in coming in from uh, Steve, but I'm not seeing it, so maybe he's left us. Um, and just chip in with another one about not believing every sign uh, there. I was looking at uh, Aberdeenshire uh, two or three years ago, Near Port Elphinstone, there's a big sign there overlooking the site at the end of the Aberdeenshire Canal. Mm. And that tells you um, there that uh, it was all uh, planned and built by Thomas Telford. Completely wrong. It was all John Rennie's work. Nothing to do with Telford at all there. But the sign tells you all about it. The bloke must have made the whole thing up. <laughs> Mike, it's Steve Hedworth. Um, Hi there, Steve. I, I kind of type quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> to reply, uh, I could be quick as uh, talking. Um, basically, there's very little evidence, uh, British Geological Science or anything like that, for any workings of any sort up there. But if you look at the map sort of thing, you can make a case um, with the mineral, with um, the false structures and all that. So really, in order to check it out, it needs feet on the ground. You need to go. You need need to check these areas out and actually um, uh, and take samples because that's right. the problem with the, the work that's been done in the past. There's never been any samples, which to me is amazing because that's the first thing you do. You know, as, as a miner, you you would want samples. Yeah, I I, I should have realised you'd be talking about sampling for um, as, as regards the mining, um, Steve. Um, for those who aren't, most of you won't know Steve, but for those who are, aren't familiar with him, he's a former mining engineer. So um, that's... I'm not uh, an engineer. I'm just, just a miner. <laughs> oh, just a miner. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I get that wrong. I do apologise. Well, yeah. you, you talk so knowledgeably, that. Steve. I just assume. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, unmute, I'll unmute myself now. I'll mute myself now. Okay. Right. And I think... That is probably it, unless we have anyone who needs to ask a question who couldn't 
uh, type in the chat. I'll give 30 seconds just for anyone to come in. And while we've got that 30 seconds, doesn't look like it. Um, all it remains for me to do is to not only thank John for an excellent and fascinating talk, as always, as many other people have done in the chat, by the way, and continue to do, uh, but also to thank the entire team. You only see me and occasionally Jeff um, pop in on the night, but um, we have other people in the background who make sure everything runs smoothly. Thanks to Elizabeth, as always, for passing on the questions and emails so I don't miss anybody. Um, I think, who, who else do we have this evening? Rob Entwistle and... Have I missed anybody? Elizabeth? I don't, I don't think so this evening. Yeah, Elizabeth? Uh, Elizabeth, I've already thanked. Oh, sorry. Uh, and <laughs> Jeff Lunn, of course, who hosted it and who you saw briefly, who couldn't get the, the poll to work, but we did it anyway. And the answer was absolutely conclusive. Well, not absolutely. Three people thought it might be, so pretty much conclusive though. No, it's not. Um, yeah, all the thanks are coming in on the chat. Let's see if there's anything else. No other questions. So with that, I will wish everybody good night. Thank you for attending. Um, our next talk is, I haven't got it in front of me. I think it's Mike Bishop next, isn't it? I think so. Um, next month. Um, I'll make the uh, booking for that available probably in a few days to a week's time, certainly within the next week. Okay, with that, I wish you all good night. Thanks again to John and good night.